Sometimes you just take my breath away. You watch my love grow like a child. Sometimes gentle and so. Sometimes you just take my breath away. And it's too good to slip by, and it's too good to lose. Too good to be there. Just to lose. I'm gonna stand on a mountain top and tell the good news that you take my breath away. Since my life is yours, my heart will be singing for you eternally. Sometimes you just take my breath away. And it's too good to slip by, and it's too Jesus, take my breath away. the street. The title of this talk is To Know Christ and Talking Intimately with Him is to Pray. And I'd really like to just make three points, three quick, poignant points about this. And I'll tell you the three points. 
contemplation, creation, and confession. C, C, C. Yes, yes, yes. C is yes in Spanish. C. Yes, yes, yes. C, C, C. And I think, well, I know for me, the greatest obstacle in my life to greater knowledge of Christ and to greater intimacy with Him and to have more and better and greater prayer to Him, through Him, and with Him is that I don't know how to be swept off my feet as often as I could. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. That's why I began with that beautiful prayer, that song, to take my breath away. Most of the times, the breath gets taken away in my life like this. <sighs> Instead of, oh, Jesus. It's more like, oh, Jesus. Instead of, oh, Jesus. And we've lost our capacity to get swept off our feet. I mean, who's the we? I don't like talking in we. Because then I stand up here as a spokesman for you and for the world. Who am I? It's one of St. Francis's greatest questions. He prayed before God. Who am I? And who are you? It's a great prayer. Who am I? And who are you? So who am I to stand up here and say we, 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 we? It's another way to say yes, 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 yes. It's the French. <laughs> in the key we lend, you just say yes or yes. But nonetheless, we've lost, oh, here we go, we. I know I've lost my capacity for wonder. I know that about me. And, and awe, to be in awe. We went and we, we saw the, uh, the penguins in Phillip Island in Australia. And I wish I had a chance to go see the coast in New Zealand and to be just swept off my feet. I wish I could see thousands and thousands of sheep. And I wish I could see, and I saw the stars last night. And I'm in awe of the stars. And we went to the coast. I had a chance on what some of the brothers and the sisters, and we went to the coast, and we saw some of the, the beauty in Australia. And I'm sure it's even greater here in New Zealand. And it, oh. I'll drink to that. Unfortunately, I'm going to look at it from the window of the airplane probably in like about four hours. But that's life. But the point is, I've lost my capacity to get swept off my feet many times. Especially in the midst of the hurly-burly of life. You know, it's one thing when the stars are shining and I'm like, well, isn't this a lovely night? No, but what about when I'm in my comings and in my goings? Oh, and then it's a much different story. And I think the remedy for me, and if your experience is anything like mine, then the remedy for you is to recover awe in your life. Not awe, baby. Not that kind of awe, but the awe. In Hebrew, when it says we ought to fear the Lord, fear of the Lord is to be in awe of God. Doesn't mean fear like, oh, don't hit. It's not like that. But it's the kind of fear that might make us go oh, and throw us to our knees and make us bow in adoration. It's the feeling, why do you think we genuflect in church? <coughs> Look at our reverence and our genuflections in church. It's like, think somebody was playing basketball and making a move on the rugby, rugby field. But there's no more. We're in the church, the divine presence of Jesus. To, not that we have to put a show on. You know what? You want to put a show on? Go to California and apply to Hollywood you want to put a show on but to be in awe of our God and the mysteries that he's given us to bow. And if you can't, if, and if you can't, my knees are bad. So a lot of times I bow, but instead of going and going on my way, even if I gotta stand there, I just, and over a prayer. I mean, we don't have to put on a show. It's not the point. And if we're not in awe over the mystery of the Eucharist, we have big troubles. So to recover awe in our life, what is awe? I have a great definition that I love from my friend, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. He's dead now, and I never knew him when he was alive, but I know him through his books. And he says this, awe is a way of being in rapport with the mystery of all reality. Awe is an intuition for the creaturely dignity of all things 
and their preciousness to God. A realization that things not only are what they are, but also stand, however remotely, for something absolute, ultimate meaning, and ultimate wisdom are not found within the world, but in God. And the only way to wisdom is through our relationship to God. And that relationship is awe. Awe, in this sense, is more than an emotion. It is a way of understanding. Awe is itself an act of insight into a meaning greater than ourselves. Awe enables us to perceive in the world intimations of the divine. To sense in small things the beginning of infinite significance. To sense the ultimate in the common and the simple and to feel in the rush of the passing the stillness of the eternal. That's why the first point I want to make is contemplation. We need to take the time and make the time to contemplate. I love my friend Father William McNamara, who's a Carmelite, a discalced Carmelite. I love his definition of contemplation, to take a long, loving look at the real, with the capital R. That everything comes from God, everything is going back to God. And to take, a, and even the difficult things, not just the beautiful stars, but the ugliness in the world. It's hard to take a long, loving look at what's real in the South Bronx. We see a lot of poverty, a lot of violence, a lot of brokenness, a lot of pain. It's hard to take a long, loving look at that. It's hard to take a long, loving look at what's going on in our church and what's going on in our world. And we need to be greater contemplatives. And if we do not learn how to be swept off of our feet, we will not learn how to contemplate. We will not learn how to look. We will be blind. And we will be deaf. And our, contemplating, our contemplation is to really support and to strengthen our consecration to Our Lady, to our Lord, our baptismal consecration, our Marian consecration, the vows for those of you who are married in your consecration, in that mystery, in the sacrament of matrimony, those who are priests, those who are religious, in their consecration in their vows, in the consecration of the priesthood, and most especially our baptism, which is the center and the source of every other consecration. And then, through greater contemplation and greater fidelity, through greater contemplation and through greater fidelity in our consecration, we will have more commitment. Then we will offer better worship to the Lord and service to one another. It's so important for us to be awake and aware and to be full of wonder and full of awe. And that's why our church gives us the Eucharist and all of the sacraments. And these sacraments are great transitions for transformation. When we take simple bread and wine up the aisle to the altar for the offertory at Mass, it becomes the body and the blood, the soul and the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you have to have real bread and real wine. You can't use tea and cookies. It's got to be real. And if our lives are not divine enough, it's because they're not human enough. Because the church teaches that grace builds on nature. So it's so important to care for the preciousness of our nature, of our human nature. So that the divine nature can come to full maturity in our lives. And not just something that we hear somebody talk about at a conference, but something that you can go home about and you can be in awe of and you can wonder about. Now, it doesn't matter how old you are, whether you're 13 or 23 or 33 or 43 or 53 or 63 or 73 or 83 or 93. I hope. According to my plans, the more time, the better. 
but I leave that to him. When he thinks I'm ready to go, that's when I want to go. So the church gives us these great transitions for transformation in our life, in the mysteries of the sacraments. And the second point about creation, in terms of helping us to come to know Christ, to talk intimately with Him, and to pray with Him. And we need to look at Jesus. Our Lord Jesus Himself was able to find the beginning of infinite significance in the simple and in the common things of life. In Matthew chapter 6, he talks to us about the birds of the air and the flowers. He puts it this way, our Lord says, life is more than food, the body is more than clothing. This is from Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25. Then he says, look at the birds in the sky. Take a long, loving look at the birds. That's the other thing. The birds that fly around here. I feel like I'm in a big bird cage all the time. It's just beautiful. When we first went to Callista in Victoria, in, in, in Australia, I couldn't believe it. First, the magpies. I saw them in Denver. You may believe it. I got excited over a magpie. So you can imagine what New York is like. Then they had these red parrots flying around. And the cockatoos, these big white things with the, all the things on their head flying around. And then the other ones, the sounds, I felt like I was in the jungle. The cuckoo burpers. That was amazing. I felt like I was in the jungle. When I was coming up to the chapel or going into the main house from where we were staying, and these, these guys and girls started singing, I was like, oh, where are they? I was expecting somebody to come jumping out from behind a bush with a machete. But our Lord Jesus tells us to look at the birds in the sky. And then he tells us to learn from the wild flowers. He tells us to learn from the wild flowers. Why? Does he want us to open up a greenhouse factory? Does he want us to be horticulturists? Does he want us to go into fixing up uh, the, the, the beautiful arrangements? Here they are. I love the ones around our lady. Magnificent. These have been picked, but the ones out in the field, they caught his attention. Why? There's ultimate significance. And Jesus teaches us this. He says, Your Father feeds the birds in the sky, and your Father clothes the flowers in the field. When Jesus looks at the flowers, He just doesn't say, Oh, what a pretty flower. He sees the pretty flower, and it moves Him. But He says, Oh, Father, I thought you it's so beautiful. And when he sees the birds, he says, My father feeds the birds. And Jesus loves to feed. He fed the multitudes with bread. But he gives you and me himself to eat. Now, if that doesn't make you fall on your knees in awe and wonder, I don't know what will. That we consume our God. That is awesome. But Jesus sees the Father. Because the point of creation in our coming to know Christ more, in our talking more intimately with Him, and to learn how to pray, is that's how He talked with the Father when He went off to the mountains alone. We do not have in the Bible what He said. He probably didn't say much. We don't know. But we know what He said to us. And when He talks to us about the flowers and the birds, He has the Father in view. Creation is to lead us to the Creator. And it has ultimate meaning, the providential care of our God and of our Father. We see it again in John chapter 15. And by the way, when was the last time you picked up your Bible? Don't answer. And I don't mean because you had to give a talk or you had to dust your credenza where the Bible's sitting on. When was the last time you picked it up to read it? I don't mean if you're religious and you prayed your divine office. And I don't mean if you're a priest and you had to prepare for a conscience to give a talk. But when was the last time you picked up the Bible so that God could talk to you? And you could listen to Him. Don't answer. Just think about it. In 
Testament. How many of you have a Bible too big up? Sometimes you just got the big white ones that the family Bible and you say to kids, don't touch that, you're going to get your fingerprints on it. Or you're going to ruin the gold edges on the side of the pages. Well, for crying out loud, go get yourself $4 and buy yourself a Bible that you can mark up, color up, and rip up if you need to. Treat it reverently, of course, only because of your hunger and your devouring the word in that sense of tearing it up with reverence. But if you turn to the Gospel of John in chapter 15, listen to what Jesus says. I am the true vine. Jesus loves flowers and vines. And my Father is the vine grower. And this has ultimate significance. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit. And everyone that does, he prunes. So that it bears more fruit. You are already pruned because of the word that I spoke to you. And remain in me as I remain in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. To know Christ and to remain in Him is to pray to Him. Now, how do you remain in Him? Well, that's a good question. And the answer of that question needs to be answered every day. How have we remained today with Jesus? There's no one simple answer. Sorry. Every day we have to ask ourselves that question. Well, good way to examine yourself before you go to bed at the end of the day. How did I remain with Jesus today? Not a bad question. Not a bad examination of conscience. And the created world can help us to come to terms with the world to come. Where we remain with him forever. That's why when Jesus taught us in the, in the prayer, the Our Father, for the will to be done, how? On earth as it is in heaven. This is the doctrine of Jesus. This is his most profound doctrine. Even as he established the church, it's the most profound mystery of the church because in the Eucharist, the bread from heaven comes to us daily. And you can get that in no other place than in our Catholic church. Oh yes, our Orthodox brothers and sisters believe in the real presence too. But it's the Catholic church. And St. Francis, how can I talk about the birds and not talk about St. Francis? I really don't like those, did you ever see those statues of St. Francis, of Assisi, with all the birds on them? Did anybody ever see them? You've got them here, you probably have a kiwi bird on your shoulder, don't you? Well, that would be nice, but a lot of those statues, they make St. Francis look like a real softy, you know? Just like some, you know, with the birds all around them. St. Francis was a fierce, fiery person. Oh, he was a man of peace and of great holiness. He just didn't stand there all day and play with the birds. That's how they make him out to be. Do you ever see the movie Brother, Son, Sister Moon? St. Francis just skipping through life? No, 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 no. With St. Clair running around. No, 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 no. That's not the real St. Francis. Sorry. No. He loved Jesus so much. And of course, he loved the birds. St. Francis did love the birds, and he loved the flowers. But in the way that Jesus looked at the flowers and looked at the birds, and he saw the Father. I mean, St. Francis was so crazy, he could see two sticks on the floor crossing each other. He'd kneel down a genuflect. He says, there's a cross. Everywhere he looked, he'd see the cross. He, used to, he loved music. He's even crazier than me. He would pick up two sticks and rub them together, and he was playing for the brothers. Nah, nah. Then, he, then he was doing that, and he saw an angel. Angel came to him and prayed. He saw the world to come. Angels came to him. And it wasn't even a real violin. He was rubbing two sticks. And then, when he looked down, and he was, had, the, had the bow crossing the, the strings of the violin in the form of a cross, and he would break down and weep. Because he said, oh my goodness, Jesus. So he would see two sticks, and he would make believe it was a violin and sing. Angels came and visited him, and then he would weep. Because in the created world, he saw the world to come. And this is to know Christ. 
Christ, risen triumphant from the dead, has opened the gateway for the new world for us here and now. Don't wait for your funeral to believe it's true. Let's not wait for that last bright. Let's get it right now. And St. Francis saw ultimate significance in the created world. As a matter of fact, he even wrote a beautiful song, the Canticle of the Creatures. And he praises God, most high, all powerful, good Lord, all praise is yours, all glory, all honor, all blessing. To you alone, most high, do they belong, and no mortal lips are worthy to pronounce your name. All praise be yours, my Lord, through all that you have made. And first, to my Lord, brother, son, who brings the day and whose light you give us through him. How beautiful is he and how radiant in all his splendor. And he goes on praising God for Sister Moon and for the sister stars. In heaven you made them bright. He praises the Lord for Brother Wind and Air. He praises the Lord for Sister Water. He praises the Lord for Brother Fire. He praises the Lord for Sister Earth, our mother, who feeds us and produces various fruits and colored flowers and herbs. All praise be yours. Then he goes from the common and the simple to the ultimate. And he says, praise be yours, my Lord, through those who grant pardon for love of you. Through those who endure sickness and trial. Happy those who endure in peace. By you, most high, they will be crowned. And all praise be yours, my Lord, through sister death. From whose embrace no mortal can escape. And that's not the old, most ultimate thing. It's not the death that people die that we need to be afraid of. It's the death that people live. The death that people live here and now and the death that people are going to live in the world to come when death will be seen as a blessing. I see people who are living dead in the South Bronx walking around because their lives are ruined because of crack. Do you hear a crack? It's a crazy kind of drug that's man-made. I believe in the real, material, physical, bodily presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. And I got news for you. I believe in the bodily, physical, material presence of evil in drugs. It's from the cocoa from cocaine that grows in the trees and the leaves naturally that man takes and manipulates into a substance that I've heard junkies tell me who shot heroin and dope for years and years and years that that stuff is like Kool-Aid next to crack. It's like drinking a glass of water. Next to crap. It's evil. It's evil. People stabbed. There was a nun, 65 years old, that worked at a place called My Brother's Place. She was stabbed 65 times throughout her body by a 21-year-old guy who she had to ask to leave this house because he broke all the rules. He quit his job. He lost his job. He was acting up. He was acting out. He was misbehaving. She said, honey, you got to go. He came back two days later, all cracked up, and killed her. I mean, okay, murder's bad enough. But why? The multiple wounds, it's evil. It is evil. It, it, it's terrible, it's disgusting, and it's rotten, and it stinks. And I see the death that people live. I've also seen people rise from this dead. But you know what? That's the death that we have to be afraid of. The death that people live. And not only in this world, because there's a death that people are going to live in the world to come. And I hope it's not me, and I hope it's not you. And when St. Francis looked, as Jesus taught him to look at the flowers in the field and the birds in the sky, that led him to this ultimate question and concern about the death. Not the people, not the death that people die, but the death that people live. And this is to know Jesus. Because he came to save us from that death. That's why he says, anyone who eats this bread will live forever. You'll never die. So like, well, I just lost my mother. You said you're never going to die. What is he? What is he doing? That's not what he's talking about. Jesus is heaven on earth. That's why he tells us to pray for the will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven's the criteria. Heaven is the criteria of our prayer. That's why the Eucharist is the center of our life and the center of our prayer and the model for all prayer. And that's why we have a heavenly mother. The rosary is a heavenly mystery. And the things of the earth, the simple things of bread and wine, the simple things of birds and flowers are to put us in touch with the world to come here and now. And this is what St. Francis was in touch with. And it doesn't just have to be St. Francis. It's got to be you 
and it's got to be me. And we don't have to write a beautiful song like this. We just need to look. We need to know Christ. We need to make time. We need to be swept off of our feet. We need to learn how to pray. So we need to be contemplatives. We need to contemplate so that our consecration can be more fruitful and effective. And we need to look and see and behold the created world so that we can continually be in tune with our creator. And look at all the opportunities we have, even the created world of your car. If your cars are anything like us in the Bronx, we don't buy them. I see the cars are in really good shape here. We don't have too much rust. And they all seem to run pretty well. You got, we don't buy cars. We beg. We get donations. You've got to see the things we get. <laughs> so these created worlds, could, uh, these things of the created world can help us be in tune with the world to come. Absolutely. You step in one of these cars, and I tell you, we've got a couple good ones, thanks be to God. But I tell you, we could sit here and tell you car stories and how God provides for hours. So even if you say, I don't have any beautiful flowers, I know you got lots of beautiful flowers in New Zealand. And if you've gotten so grown and accustomed to them that you've you lost the sight of their beauty, or if you've gotten so grown and accustomed to the Eucharist that you don't know how to express your awe and your reverence and you've never felt that awe, and you've never thought about it, think about it. Lastly, confession. And I don't just mean the confession, when we hear confession, usually we think of the sacrament of confession, that's good. But I mean the confession that we have in our church. We have prophets, we have martyrs, and we have confessors of the faith. These are people who had something to say. And they had something to say because they had an experience of Jesus. And their knowledge of Christ came by their experience of Christ, which led them to talk intimately with him, which led them to prayer. And the confessors of our faith in the church gave good examples. It's about living the message of the gospel. Living the messages that are coming from heaven, from Fatima, and Chigori, from here, there, and everywhere. We got more messages now coming all over, from all over the place. People saying to me, Father, did you read this? Father, did you read that? I said, look, excuse me, I'm having trouble with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I don't know about this one, that one, the other one. I don't know. And it's true. This is the rule of the life of St. Francis. This is the rule of the life of the Friars Minor, to live the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on with about 10 or 12 chapters. But that's the first sentence, that's the essence. So to confess our faith. Now, if you say, well, what are you talking about? Well, let me tell you this. Our Holy Father, Pope John Paul, is the hero, one of the heroes of our community. Is he your hero? You love him? Yes. We love him. And as you might know, did you know that this is the International Year of the Family? How many people knew that? You did? Woo! Good for you, New Zealand. So the Pope calls this the International Year of the Family, along with the United Nations. And you know what he calls the family? The great mystery of God. And he adds that modern rationalism does not tolerate mystery. That's why the society today and the world does not want to tolerate family values. And we've heard Father Stephen and others say some tremendous things about that. And our Holy Father speaks of the family as the domestic church, the little church. And he says that prayer must become the dominant element of the year of the family in the church. Prayer by the family, prayer for the family, and prayer with the family. You want to be a confessor of the faith? When was the last time that you asked somebody in your family? When was the last time you asked your husband or your wife? Honey, would you like to say a prayer? Would you like to read a psalm together? How, now maybe some say, well, we pray the rosary every now. That's good. And God bless you. Keep it up. What about other members of your family? Somebody comes over to the house. Would you like to say a prayer? Would you like to pray a psalm together before you go home? They look at you like you're some kind of a nut. Would you do? Go to one of those crazy conferences? Oh, you're a holy roller. Oh, you're one of those weirdos. And you start getting all kinds of names. And they identify you. They tag you as a certain type. We love doing that in this world. Oh, this is this type. This is that type. This is another type. Very dangerous. But what a challenge. Right? And it's very difficult to do. I know that. Or, or, or parents with children. Before you go out, before you go, can we just say a little prayer? Oh, there, there she goes again. I know it's difficult to do. But we've got to do it anyway. And that, I would challenge you with that. And if you've been doing it and you have no luck, keep doing it. Persevere. 
And then the second type of confession is the confession of our sins. And what greater way to talk more intimately with Christ? I mean, it's, it's a whole side of intimacy that sometimes we'd rather not remember, that we'd rather forget. And a lot of times when people go to confession, they say, well, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to pray for, I, I, I don't know. You know, you get all kinds of vague and general. Like, well, yeah, I was, uh, Father, I, uh, I was kind of impatient and I was a little slacking in my prayers. That's about it. Or this guy who went to confession, he said, Father, I stole the robe. He stole the robe? And I see, the priest is not supposed to be Sherlock Holmes in confession. He's not supposed to be asking all these questions. Unless it's necessary. So he says, you stole the rope. Okay, was it a lot of rope? Like a trailer truck full of rope or something? No, Father. Okay. Or was it a gold rope? No, Father. Okay. Uh, is there anything special about this rope that you need to tell me about? Well, there was a horse attached to the end. <laughs> oh. So you didn't steal the rope, you stole the horse. Yeah, I see. The best one is this, oh father, I was fooling around. You was fooling around? We're in the kitchen, trying to make a meal? No, father. Oh, you was fooling around? Yeah, okay. Uh, you were fooling around in the garage with the car? No, father. Oh, my secretary. Oh, you was fooling around with your secretary? Yeah, are you married? Yeah. Okay, well, we kind of went away for the weekend. Oh, adultery. Yeah. Oh, I see. See, this, this thing, well, that's okay. Good for you. God bless you. You said it. All right, God can deal with this, and we'll work it out. A lot of times, there's things in our life that we would just rather not to say. And take full advantage, sisters and brothers, of the life and of the power and of the grace in the sacrament of confession so that you'll have the strength and the courage to confess your sins and then to confess the faith. See, because when we come out of the confession, we want to confess to the Lord our sins, and when we come out of confession, we want to confess to the world our faith. And that's why I hope this conference bears abundant fruit in your life, in your land, and that it bears fruit in my life, in the life of the speakers, in the life of all the people here, in the life of all the people who didn't come, because maybe they will see your example. Maybe they'll read a book. Maybe they'll listen to a tape. Maybe we can all be useful for God's grace to help us all to grow in holiness. You know, it reminds me of uh, this guy who went to confession. And for many years, he was working in a lumber yard, and he was a master craftsman. He used to make exotic and exquisite uh, furniture with exotic wood that he was stealing from the lumber yard. He had, a, he had an open back truck and he'd slip a few be, uh, beams of wood in, all types of exotic maple wood and mahogany wood and all beautiful grained wood. And he made all of these beautiful items and, and was making 400% profit on these items. And um, so he had enough. He was doing this for 30 years. And his conscience woke up and convicted him of his sin. He says, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna make a good confession. And I don't wanna do this no more. So he goes into the confession, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And he explains how he worked at the lumber yard for so many years and he was stealing the wood and he was really tired of it. You know, he said, Father, never again. I don't want to do this no more. It's over. This is it. I've been ripping people off and, and, and I'm tired of it, Father. So the priest says, well, God bless you, my son. That was a very, very, very good confession. I'm sure the Lord is pleased. So the priest comes to give him his penance. He says, to him, look, he says, for your penance, I'd like for you to make a novena. And so the guy turned to the priest and he said, okay, Father. He says, if, uh, if you uh, give me the plans, I can get you the wood. <laughs> yeah. You see? So sisters and brothers, it's not easy. It is not easy. And anybody tells you that it is easy, forget about it. Jesus did tell us to take his yoke on our shoulders and to carry his burden because it's easy in life. That's his yoke, and that's his burden. But for us to carry it on our own throughout this life and in this world, it is not easy. He told us that it's a narrow way. If you find it, it's narrow and it's rough. The road to damnation is smooth and wide, and there's a lot of people slipping and sliding. So let's be aware and let's take care to be greater contemplatives, to use the created world to lead us to the Creator and to be greater.
new confessors and to confess both in the confessional and to confess our faith. And we need help to do this. We need help of a very special person. And something that can happen to us as we do this, as we know Christ, as we talk intimately with him and as we pray, is to experience joy in the midst of sorrow. When Jesus carried the cross, the Bible tells us that for the sake of the joy which lay before him, Jesus carried the cross and he endured it, heedless of his shame. So let's pray to Our Lady. One of my favorite titles is Mary, Joy of All Who Sorrow. And let us ask her to help us to experience the joy of heaven here and now in the midst of our sorrows. And I'd like to conclude.